Okay, establishing a national order. Um, this is, um, it is rare in human history that um, the world suddenly doubled in this, this period of European colonial expansion, uh, but it did. And uh, as we've seen, we have New Spain, New France, and England. The English colonies uh, here, down the Atlantic coast, down to the Spanish part, Georgia, was really, even though they claimed all the way over here to what is essentially Texas, um, was only settled in the colonial period here. The part that we're in right now uh, was part of the Creek and Cherokee Nation until 1833. Um, so this was really Atlanta, where Atlanta is now is really frontier. But the point of this slide is that there are three, unlike the sort of laws of the Indies, which set up a code book that everybody followed or was supposed to follow. I'm sure they really didn't because there's no way that they could. Circumstances tend to modify things. Uh, but the English, because of the variation in the types of settlements that we have, had no such code, had no such set of rules. And um, there were really three distinct forms of colonial settlement. The first, New England, was based on this religious covenanted community um, built around a common that we see here with common land around it in a form called a township. Originally, the townships were conceptually supposed to be six miles by six miles square. But um, what was the most important thing and the rarest thing that was available to them? I mentioned it earlier, grass. There are no turf grasses. The grass that we see growing out here uh, didn't exist. That's actually English pasture grass, festuca. The, the stuff that turns brown, uh, the, the warm season grasses are from Japan or from Bermuda. Uh, there are no turf grasses native to North America. Bahia is native to South America, but in North America, there were no native turf. Poa patrins. Pratensis, which is Kentucky bluegrass, um, is originally from China. Now, these turf grasses, as they exist today, what you see on a golf course or a football field or probably in your front yard, uh, these are essentially man-made. These have been engineered uh, to try to adjust to the uh, particular climate that we have here, which is very different from the places that they originated in. Some were easy to adapt, like zoysia, which does very well here. Um, Bermuda, which does very well here, and some like fescue, uh, you get over 80 degrees and uh, Fahrenheit, and it's, it has trouble, right? Um, it, it sort of melts out. And so there's a lot of engineering that goes on at places like Auburn and Georgia and Clemson that have these large schools of agriculture that are trying to sort of hybridize and engineer in agricultural engineering, genetically modify these grasses to withstand various climates in North America. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I, make this, I make this point because um, it meant that they could not conform to this six by six square mile uh, sort of ideal that they had originally thought of. These were called townships, um, and they uh, had a center and then common fields around it, um, but they could not actually conform to that because of topography, the circumstances of where water was located, where they could get grass, where they could cl clear fields, et cetera. Um, so New England is a very different sort of landscape, a very different settlement pattern than these mid-Atlantic states that we have here, uh, southern New Jersey, Pennsylvania in particular, um, which is um, developed in a very different way for very different purposes by very different people. William Penn, who was a lawyer, an intellectual, uh, had this kind of idealized uh, plan to create this town that would be open to everyone, et cetera. And um, it didn't develop the way he had anticipated, of course, uh, but it set a precedent of this one, two, three, four, five, six, and then um, streets numbered, indexed, and then these locust, cherry, plum, juniper, peach tree, et cetera. And uh, very influential because most of the courthouse towns um, actually uh, that develop in the Midwest actually are derived from, uh, as we'll see, from the Philadelphia plan. 
in fact, all cities, Atlanta is an example, uh, the part of the city that we're in now is actually developed in part in imitation of Philadelphia. It's probably the most influential um, plan of the colonial period in what is now North America if we consider the entire sweep from uh, the close of the 18th century to World War II. That was what was very, uh, Philadelphia in particular, was very influential. And then the South, uh, these individually owned large land ownings, these plantations, wealthy people who uh, are actually acquiring land and raising some sort of a crop or some sort of a product that they then ship back to the mother country um, to be manufactured with isolated courthouses, courthouses like the one we saw at Appomattox, which has no town around it. They were simply in a clearing in the woods. Uh, there's one here that says courthouse. Um, these are very different, um, very different uh, people, very different traditions, no uh, standard uh, way of subdividing land, no standard way of laying out towns. Uh, now, if you look at this map, what you see is that this is the part that had been settled here, um, as well as this part that we see down in here in Texas, parts of California here, 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 some here, um, that uh, had been settled prior to the war with England, that, that the War of Independence, the war that what we call the Revolution, which was really not a revolution. It was really a war of separation, a war of independence. And um, after that, and this is what doesn't happen very often, is you have to invent a nation. You have to actually invent a country. And we think about that in, in modern terms. We think about that in terms of constitutional elections and so on and so forth. But what we have is actually also systems of weights and measures, monetary policy, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Well, these are Spanish. Uh, this is part of New Spain. San Francisco, Spanish. Los Angeles, Spanish. Those are the shortened names. Like San Antonio, they had, you know, the names had, you know, were very long. Actually, it's like, I, I can't remember now, but it's San Antonio de Valero de Bexar, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's a very long thing. Well, Florida was, but as I said, the Spanish never really knew what to do in Florida. I mean, Florida is essentially all sand. There's no stone. Um, the Mediterranean architectural tradition, construction tradition, was a masonry tradition from Rome and so forth. Um, and there's no stone to build with. So um, whereas the, the British who settled in New England, uh, things were familiar. It was a forest. This whole area is a forest, huge forest. And uh, northern Europe was also a forest, and they sort of had traditions of wood architecture. So they knew what to do. Their tools worked. They had a ready supply of wood, et cetera. So, yeah, this should be part of New Spain, but uh, it's not shown on that map for some reason. I didn't make the map. I'll have to get the source and then write a letter and say, shouldn't Florida be part, since St. Augustine is the oldest Spanish in what is now the continental United States. So, um, but the point is that uh, these were, were the system of settlement and, and, and system of surveying was different. Obviously, this is systematic, planned as a unit, right? Systematic. Um, this is unsystematic. This was actually what's called a system of meets and bounds, where you kind of go, if you look at deeds, old deeds in this part of the world, even in Atlanta here, um, rural parts of Georgia, uh, it'll say things like, from the large oak tree in a southwesterly direction for 432 feet or something. And, um, you know, the, the tree died in 1830 or something. <laughs> you know, so you don't have any idea what's going on. In fact, Joel Cowan, who is a uh, is the professor of servant leadership here in the Scheller College, uh, Joel, for some reason, likes this course. He actually audited it three complete years. Joel's participation in his class is better than almost any student I've ever had. Joel, um, when he was in his 20s, conceived and um, of Peachtree City. And if he was here, 
uh, to tell the story, what he would tell you is that he was trying to buy land, but he realized he didn't have good deeds because he couldn't close the surveys in this old meets and bounds system. And so he realized at some point that if he incorporated it as a city, right, got the legislature to create a city, that then all of those problems would go away. All those legal problems would go away because he could actually then just consolidate all the land owned by this corporation he created called Peachtree City. He created that. He was 24 years old when he came up with that. It took him two years to get it through the legislature, but he did it. And then um, he acquired all the land that is now Phipps Plaza, and he developed Phipps Plaza, and he made a ton of money and retired in his 40s, and he teaches here for a salary of a dollar a year, and he um, actually is involved in building schools in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. He does a lot of work in Ukraine. Uh, and he's the kind of guy who has about 50 pies in the oven, and maybe two of them ever actually come out baked. But he's always got his fingers in just about everything going on. He's just an amazing human being. Um, I'll try to get him in here sometime. If you have an opportunity to, to uh, take one of his courses in servant leadership, I would highly recommend it. He is a remarkable man and uh, we should take advantage of him while he's still with us. Uh, he's quite old now, but he's here in this college, um, working for a dollar a year, which is, we joke about it, but it's actually more than what I'm working for. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, so the problem then was what to do with this unmapped, unsettled territory here that um, in the what is really the Midwest, uh, that England claimed, had claimed up to New France, which is really coming down the Mississippi here, uh, but was rather vague. They didn't really have limits to it. You know, like now you know that's the border between Mexico and the United States, but or between Canada and the United States, but there was no border. There was no way they could establish that. So it was rather vague. It was the vagueness of the land. The territory was sort of unmapped, unsettled. And so the, the, the fledgling government here wanted to settle this as quickly as possible, thinking that, you know, we don't want those French to get a hold of it or the Spanish to get a hold of it or the English, in fact, who we just fought a war with, to come up and say, well, um, it's still part, of, still part of England. So they tried to settle it as quickly as possible. Now, the problem is that they had these three different, very different traditions, um, and the system of meets and bounds with isolated courthouses, no towns around it, this sort of idealized city that uh, clearly is planned as a unit, and this, which was a kind of covenanted community of a particular type of Puritan, of Puritan form uh, of uh, Protestant Christianity that sort of no one else other than this very small area um, really had any relationship to. Plus, the Puritan, uh, the Puritans had sort of dissolved, right? They, as they moved west, by the time they get to western Massachusetts, it's dissolved, and um, it, it dissolves fairly, uh, dissolves fairly quickly. Uh, just to show you, this is um, called a doodle plat, um, and uh, this is an example of a meets and bounds survey uh, from the colonial period. I believe that's along the Oconee River. Um, I love this. I love, <laughs> I love this little doodle down here. But this is interesting. Unknown land. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. So they had to come up with a scheme, not only of writing a constitution and having all of the things that come along with governing, but also coming up with a system of settlement. So for the Western Reserve. In fact, today you probably are aware that there is still a university in Ohio called the Case. Western Reserve, right? And the Western Reserve refers to uh, this area that we see here, claimed by England, uh, but unsettled. And so they passed in 1785, um, actually they passed two of these. The first one was in 1784, uh, a law, National Land Ordinance, which, like the laws of the Indies in a sense, set up the rules uh, for how, in fact, uh, all the territory west of the Ohio River would be settled. 
Um, within a year, they rewrote the law because it was they didn't think it, they thought it had flaws in it, and so it was rewritten. Now Thomas Jefferson had been put in charge of this, but Jefferson was a a great procrastinator. He was probably the world's greatest procrastinator. I'm running him a close second, but uh, but he actually um, never finished anything. And um, in fact, his book, his book Notes on the State of Virginia, uh, was commissioned by the Continental Congress because there was a very famous naturalist from French named Buffon. Uh, Buffon was so famous he even had a statue erected of him in his lifetime, still there in the Jardin de Plantes in Paris. And uh, Buffon had said, had written a, a treatise, um, a paper, and Buffon had said that uh, the French government should not support the colonies, the English colonies against England because um, nothing in North America would ever amount to anything based on the fact that all the animals and plants in North America were simply degraded forms of those that were to be found in Europe. Amazing, right? So uh, Jefferson was commissioned by the Continental Congress to write a rebuttal. He was sort of the closest thing to an intellectual we had, he and Benjamin Franklin. And um, so he started it, but it was not finished until the war was over. And if you read this book, it's fascinating. You can buy it probably in Barnes & Noble up here called Notes on the State of Virginia. It's this, this rambling sort of um, uh, unfocused, series of thoughts, some of which are fascinatingly brilliant, some of which are stupid, um, but it, it begins with like things like rivers, and he inventories all the rivers, and he inventories all the plants, and he inventories all this, you know, and he does all, and then he will go on some sort of um, excursion off somewhere about education, and what was wrong with education, and how edu what, what was, how we really should set it up, and and uh, there are a lot of quotes, a lot of people are fond of quoting Jefferson uh, because he was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. Um, anyway, long story short, fortunately for us, Jefferson um, never finished um, his work here. He was supposed to draft this ordinance. And he was called away to, um, f to be the first ambassador to France, oh, to complete the story. And so he packed a buffalo head. North American bison, buffalo head in a crate, and he made an appointment with Monsieur Buffon, and Buffon received him, and he opened up the crate and took the buffalo head and put it on the table in front of Buffon and said, what European animal is this descended from? And Buffon finally had to admit that there was no such animal anywhere in the old world, right? I think it's absolutely hilarious. Can you imagine doing that, shipping this buffalo head? You ever seen a buffalo up close? The head is about like that, right? And um, shipping this thing across the Atlantic and then sort of presenting it to this famous French naturalist is really funny. Well, fortunately for us, Jefferson was called away and the task fell to a man from North Carolina, which I find interesting. It was a, um, one of those colonial slave states, right, producing. But what he produced was something quite different, uh, you, would, you would think. He, he produced a compromise of these three traditions that we talked about, um, and we'll see what that compromise is. So here's the actual law. You can read it. And um, so in 1785, um, remember the three things here, the um, New England, the six-by-six-mile townships, the mid-Atlantic, a grid plan with numbered streets and small land holdings of about 160 to about 40 acres, um, and then the southern, these independent courthouse districts with circuit courts, and this would ultimately become the standard federal system. Um, within this, um, particularly in the areas that on the Doodle Plat were shown as unknown land, uh, vernacular institutions developed, particularly in the south, because there were no towns to speak of. Um, the independent courthouse with churches and other uses that were displaced off of the, the center of the town. The crossroads non-denominational church. Um, the camp meeting grounds, the sort of religious revivals that, that developed. Um, the Grange Hall, that was more in New England, 
but it was a sort of rural improvement society for sharing knowledge about, um, about how to produce better crops, about how to bake better pies. Uh, the county fair, which was part of that where you won a prize if you had the best pie or the prize pig or something. Um, the um, academy, which uh, was originally intended to be sort of, these were typically founded by churches, by um, a lot of Presbyterian um, Presbyterian denominations founded these academies. There's one, some of these survive. Uh, some of them converted into uh, military schools, like Virginia Military Institute, VMI. Others, the Citadel. Uh, some, like Davidson College, which was founded by the Presbyterians. Uh, Berea College in Kentucky, which is trying to educate sort of uh, the mountain folks of West Virginia and uh, Eastern Kentucky and so forth. Um, and some of these actually, as I just mentioned, survived. Um, a lot of them uh, did not. But these were uh, the, 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 um, the sort of vernacular institutions, social institutions that developed in this uh, unknown uh, territory. So what Hugh Williamson and his committee came up with, um, here's the Ohio River, was a system of square subdivisions which would be called townships. Each of these townships uh, were to be six, 36 square miles, six miles by six miles, and then they would be divided up into equal square sections of 640 acres each. Uh, 640 acres, if you do the arithmetic, is exactly one mile on a side, right? Now, had, I mentioned this earlier, but it's important, had the United States, the war with England, occurred 20 years later, we would be on the metric system like the rest of the world, and all of this um, sort of Roman system that we use, feet and inches and so forth, um, would be relegated to a very obscure footnote uh, in history. But as it is, it's a living system that, that we still operate under, even though it creates certain problems. You have to have metric wrenches, and you have to have English wrenches, and you have to have all these. You have gallons, and you have liters, and how many liters are in a gallon? And You know, there's 2.46 hectares, acres in a hectare. And particularly if you're not from the United States, an acre is a very peculiar, very peculiar concept, an acre. What is an acre? Uh, it's 43,560 square feet. Well, how do you arrive at that? Well, the Roman mile, mile, was a thousand, that's mile, a thousand, uh, a thousand paces, mile paces. A pace was two steps. A step was two and a half feet. So, five feet was one pace. A thousand of those, 5,000 feet, was a mile. Now, for reasons that have puzzled me for a long time and which I gave up trying to figure out, the Romans never saw the need to reconcile the linear dimension with the area dimension, right? So those heredia, those units of land that they had, 240 um, feet on a side, there's no way you can make that equal um, 5,000 feet. And that wasn't a problem in the Middle Ages until you began to get the embryonic formation of nation states under kings and so forth when having uh, the linear dimension that you could measure correlate to um, the area dimension. Now, area dimensions to us, unless you're an architect, um, are, are peculiar ways of thinking. If I say, how far is it uh, Jennifer's originally from Macon. How far is it to Macon? An hour, she says. It's an hour to Macon. Well, I've got a bicycle. Is it still an hour? No. Um, how far is it to the airport? Well, it's 11 miles. But you would say if it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, it's an hour. But if it's uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, it's probably 20 minutes from here or something, right? Um, so... We tend to think of distance in terms of time, right? Because we are programmed to think that way 
about distance. How far is it to Paris? It's about nine hours. Well, not on a boat, you know, but it's on a plane because that's obviously the way, the most efficient way you could get there. So um, if you were living in 1800 or 1700, um, what would have been the most important um, measure? The area, the land that you owned, right? So this, 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 ability, this inability to reconcile the, the Roman 5,000 feet with the area dimensions created problems for the, the kings and the nobles because they didn't know how much land to tax, right? So they added, under Edward the Confessor, they added 280 square feet to the 5,000. And if you square 5,280, what do you come up with? 436,500 square feet. And what is in an acre? Factor 10, 43,560. Okay? Right? So uh, the acre, if you take square root of an acre... Uh, you come up with an irrational number, like, I don't know what it is, but 202.375637292 feet. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So you have to think about it in terms of units of area. All right? So that's what this is. So if you take 36 square miles, each one of those square miles is a section, it was called a section, and each one of those sections was was 640 acres, okay? Um, 640 acres. This is what Jefferson had originally proposed in 1784, and it divided the uh, Western Reserve territory into 10 rectangular states with names such as Pallisipia and Mesopotamia. Uh, some, such as Illinois, actually survived. But can you imagine? I think Mesopotamia was actually what is now Indiana. Um, can you imagine going to the University of Mesopotamia? Uh, that's kind of strange. Um, well, as I said, this didn't work. He had proposed a unit of measure based on the nautical mile, which um, only he understood. So they basically scrapped this whole thing. This, by the way, is the original document. It's a 35-millimeter slide I took in the Library of Congress of the original document. There you can see Pallisipia. Um, I forget what that one was. Poly, Polypotamia. That was one of the state's names. Polypotamia. So thank goodness Jefferson's out of the picture. Um, this is actually what did develop under Williamson's um, uh, committee. So what we're seeing here is the original survey of township number one in range five of the Ohio Territory, west of the Ohio River. And what they were looking for was a system where the linear dimension could produce a um, simple, very simple, simple to survey, due west, right? Now, because of the curvature of the earth, the longitude, the north-south lines became problematic and never did quite get it right. But, um, but this system basically stretched all the way to California. And uh, it ran over mountains, it ran over water, it ran over swamps, it ran over prairie. And then um, they held a lottery, and you could enter into the lottery if you qualified. You could enter into the lottery, and you received um, a quarter section. Well, a quarter section was 160 acres. So if you take 640 and you quarter it, you come up with four 160-acre tracks, plots. And you quarter the 160, you come up with four 40-acre plots. And you quarter the 40, and you come up with four 10-acre plots, right? 10 acres is 660 feet on a side, which is exactly an eighth of a mile. So it worked by the base eight and it, in, in the linear dimension, which then corresponded to the area dimension to the base 10 by the system of halving and quartering. Um, in other words, it still is actually the Roman system. Neither Williamson nor Jefferson 
was in any way familiar with the Roman system. Arche Ar Roman archaeology had not advanced far enough at that point where they would have known anything about it. Um, but because it was a living system, they kind of worked out the kinks to get this linear dimension to correspond to this, and that was called a quarter section. So, you know, Jennifer here enters into the lottery. Well, she was female, so she didn't qualify. So I enter into the lottery because I was white, I was over 21, way over 21, and uh, I had not been convicted of a crime, right? Nor was I a member of a gang of thieves known as the Pony Club. It was actually written into the legislation in Georgia that subdivided uh, the area that Atlanta's in now, which kind of developed in imitation of this, creating these land lots. I don't know who the Pony Club was, but you're pretty bad if you get written into the constitutional legislation, singled out, you know. <laughs> It's sort of like saying, you know, anybody can enter into this except uh, this fraternity over here on Fifth Street, you know. It's kind of. <laughs> um, so um, the, um, you were then assigned, I would have been assigned in Township 9, uh, Range 2. A north-south alignment would have been uh, is a range, home, home on the range, north-south alignment. And... Um, of the Ohio Territory, and then I would pack up my belongings and my family, and I would go out there, and I would find my plot. If I was unlucky, it was Stone Mountain <laughs> if, <laughs> or a swamp. If I was lucky, it was uh, arable land, right, farmland. Um, and it worked. Now, it, so it was simple to survey, simple to record the deeds, you just extended the lines. Um, the difficulty was finding your plot. Um, this is actually showing then the systems, the unsystematic systems, some survey patterns. French and Spanish, I mention this because of river transport. There are no roads, no highways. So the eldest, let's say I owned a, a, a piece of land here and I die, I was obligated under either Napoleonic Code or under, um, um, under um, the laws of the Indies to, and let's say I had three sons, my three sons would uh, inherit that land um, equally. So it would be divided into thirds. And then let's say each of them had three sons, and pretty soon you're down to this sliver of land that you can't do very much with. But this system that Williamson developed, the National Land Ordinance, Actually, when it encountered a previous system, it simply stopped. They kept the previous systems intact and just moved on, as we'll see here in a moment. Um, now, within this, the law says there shall be reserved for the federal government. Um, out of every township, the four lots being numbered 8, 11, 16, and 29, and out of every fractional part of a township, so many lots of the same numbers as shall be found thereon for future sales. So they held some back. There shall be reserved the lot number 16 of every township for the maintenance of public schools within the said township. Also, one-third part of all gold, silver, lead, copper to be sold or otherwise disposed of as Congress shall hereafter Direct. So the feds kept part of it. The, fed, the federation kept part of it, the national government. Um, this is actually the territory that we see here. So the 16th section was set aside for um, the school district and eventually the courthouse. The courthouse, right? You had to record the deeds. You had to record marriage licenses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that was set for the 16th section, the courthouse and the school. Now, this unit of measure, which I've already described in excruciating, uh, nauseating detail, um, is shown here because it was developed from this surveying treatise, which was called the Gunther, who was a surveyor, a German surveyor operating in England who wrote a treatise on surveying, and they, they adopted that unit of measure, which was the Gunther chain, which was a chain of 66 feet. So 10 chains equaled when squared equaled what? An eighth of a mile, known as a furlong, 
And an eighth of a mile squared is exactly 10 acres, right? A quarter of an eighth section. So that's what the Gunther chain looked like. And the word furlong, by the way, refers to um, this, the interval in the plowed field, the long furrow. It's still used in horse racing. That's the only place I know where that peculiar unit of measure is actually still used. Um, so one chain was one-tenth of a furlong. Uh, one furlong was 660 feet, which, when squared, yielded 10 acres. So the whole system, then, um, looks like this. Um, there's a flaw here, but um, in any event, the um, so you could go here from the township, and that was the legal entity, the legal entity, city of Atlanta, the incorporated entity, was to be a township of 36 sections where one section equaled one square mile, um, and the 16th section was set aside for the courthouse and the school. Each of those sections were then quartered. That was the family farm, 160 acres. And then each of those could be further subdivided down to one-eighth of a mile that we see here, there, uh, one in the top, uh, one-eighth of a mile, um, which produced 10 acres. Um, those could be further subdivided down into um, two-and-a-half-acre plots. And so it's remarkable how many towns like Chicago and Omaha, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, have two-and-a-half-acre blocks. Right? You then could take, um, because it was uh, 330 feet on a side, you then peel 30 feet off of one side, 30 feet off the other. And that produces a 60-foot right-of-way with 300-foot blocks, the same dimension that we see in Savannah, the same dimension we saw at Olynthus, um, this 300-foot dimension, which is a good dimension, actually. Um, this is how the system worked in the linear progression, and this is how it worked um, in uh, the area progression. Now, for the architects in here, does this look familiar to you? 16, 8, quarter, half, whole, right? That's where, it, that's where that comes from. This applied to um, pretty much all of North America. So if you look at it as you sort of abstractly put it together, again, you had slippage here because at some point this line, because of the curvature of the earth, you have to make an adjustment in order to get the next one. They don't line up. And um, actually, they got into the middle of um, Indiana, and they had to reset the whole system. So there's a meridian that runs through Indiana, the, the middle of Indiana, uh, which kind of recalibrated the entire system, with the 16th sections being the courthouse towns. And that's um, an aerial photograph of northern Iowa, and that produces that pattern, like the Po Valley. In Italy, it will be with us for a very, very long time to come. I was flying to Korea a few years back. Um, flight left at like 5 p.m., and we're headed west. So it was really quite an extraordinarily long sunset, uh, and the route takes you right over Canada and Alaska, and you sort of come back down that way uh, by the Arctic Circle. And it is remarkable when you fly over it, um, to see just this sweep of these squares laid out across an entire continent. The Canadian system developed in imitation of this. And then the parts of those states, like where we are now, that were not under some previous system, um, actually developed in imitation of this. So let's look at a few of these. This is part of along the first principal meridian, uh, the Michigan Meridian Survey. Um, this is where, this is around Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, where the French settlement that you see here with these long strips, and here the American system comes over and it just stops, right? <laughs> just stops. And as I said, if you were lucky, maybe you got that piece of land, not that piece of land, right? In that lottery. Um, this is actually part of Arizona, and uh, you can see that. Uh, the Baca Grant, again, a, a, um, near Prescott, Arizona, which was part of the Spanish colonial system. They just left it intact. 
Um, I love this. This is um, Minnesota Mud Lake. It doesn't sound very promising. Uh, and then you'll notice here, these, there are a lot of Scandinavian people who settled up here. So you see names like uh, Christian Skogstad Ole Olsen. Uh, the 16th section included part of Mud Lake. So somebody at some point entered into a deal where they made a land swap. Um, and a lot of times that happened when the railroad came through. Now, one of the difficulties here is that um, this is a great system if you want to go due west <laughs> or due north, right? But it is terrible if you're going from Atlanta to Seattle, right? Because um, the rights of way would mean that you are constantly moving through this thing in this zigzag pattern. Uh, obviously, railroads could not do that. And there we see it coming through. And that reordered things sometimes away from the political center to the economic center, the rail station, right? And a lot of times, even in Georgia, you will see, um, you know, towns that, um, towns that, um, oh, come on. Towns that will have a courthouse on one side and a rail station down on the other, right? The sort of a political center and an economic center. Um, so it produced this extraordinary pattern. Um, this is from about 30,000 feet over eastern Wyoming, the high plains. The circles that you see are actually pivot irrigation, where you're taking groundwater under pressure and then using that to irrigate your crops. My wife was a flight attendant with Delta Airlines for 32 years, and she and her friends, her flight crew, used to get so annoyed at people saying, Miss, Miss, what are those circles down there that they made up stories about them? Her favorite was that they were pizza farms. And she would say, um, oh, those are pizza farms. And people would say, oh, OK. <laughs> Freddie, those are pizza farms. Oh, all right. <laughs> it's pivot irrigation. This is the Willamette Valley in Oregon. It produces some very good Pinot Noir grapes. And this is, I think, um, so let's talk for a minute about what I think Jefferson, from having read notes on the state of Virginia, what he had in mind, his sort of political ideas, was that um, you would create a nation of landowners. He was very critical of cities, Jefferson was. He believed that cities, his quote was, cities add only to the body politic so much, only, was it, cities add only to democratic institutions as sores do on the hide of the body politic. Wow. All right, that's the quote that, that often puts him in the anti-urban camp. And a lot of urban history you'll read quotes Jefferson, quotes that. Um, Later, he kind of came around, but what he believed was that um, people who owned land and worked the land, that there was virtue in that, and that if you could make as much land available to as many people as possible, you would create the sort of instant middle class of landowners, and that people would then be free to participate in public life. It's very Aristotelian in his notions. Um, well, I think this is what he had in mind, that this is really an industry, uh, that you would own the land, you would work the land, you would then be free to engage both economically and socially and politically in, uh, public, in public life. Uh, so the courthouse then became the sort of center of, in, I think in his mind, the center of um, what that was to be. Um, and they developed... Uh, Gosh, we must have built thousands, I don't know how many, I'd hate to even think, 20, 30,000 of the 16th section courthouse towns. They are all derived from one of two types. The southern type, uh, which uh, scholars sort of trace to this one, 1809, uh, and this sort of moves uh, into Texas and then western to southern California. So if you go into Bakersfield, California, it has the feel of a southern town. Um, but if you go into Oregon, if you north, it breaks in the middle of the state. 
Um, you have something that is derived here from Lancaster. It's really Philadelphia, but Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The difference being that um, there are these two main streets that intersect the, the courthouse square so that the four blocks that we see here are actually sort of intended. This is very much like Philadelphia, whereas this is simply you just designate one, and that's where you build the courthouse, and everything else kind of then forms around it. Now, there are sort of hybrid forms of these um, that uh, include the, um, the Harrisonburg Square, the Four Block Square, the Lancaster Square, et cetera. And uh, we're running out of time here, so I will try to speed this up. As I think I can finish in the next two minutes. This is actually uh, one of the deeds. You, got, you had to put this land into agricultural production. It was idealized in um, the mythology, I think, of the United States, these paintings by Grant Wood, the sort of family farm. The reality was something quite different. The reality was this. It was bleak, lonely, um, cold as all get out, sod houses. Yeah, there's no wood right, on the prairie. I found this sod house actually outside of Phoenix, Arizona in 1986. So um, the government began to issue the power of eminent domain. Come back to eminent domain later to the railroad companies, Pennsylvania Railroad Company, Union Pacific, Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe, Southern Railroad, so forth, to try to push, push rail units as far west as possible, as quickly as possible, so they could actually claim land. So they actually operated like autonomous governments within the land uh, that they were given here. So the railroads actually built a whole series of these rather romantically named towns like Junction or Grand Junction. Um, and I love this map because it shows the complexity of all of this with um, near Leavenworth, Kansas, of the railroads colliding with the Shawnee uh, territory, with uh, the town Junction, the Union Pacific coming in to the north. And that, of course, then led to the original Amazon.com, which was Sears and Roebuck. Um, it's a whole interesting story in and of itself in the catalogs. Um, you can buy anything. So you're out there on the prairie living in that sod house. Started out with selling watches. But you get dresses, plates, spoons. Look at this. You could buy books. So you could have a library. Now, at this time, if you owned ten books, you were a scholar, Right? And uh, here, for not a whole lot of money, you could get the complete works of, um, I don't know, whoever this is, Victor Hugo. So you're living out in this mud hut out somewhere out in Kansas Territory, and you've got the entire works of William Shakespeare, right? Amazing. Uh, in fact, you could even buy a house. The house would be prefabricated, disassembled. The component parts would be numbered. And then you would provide the foundation, and then you would build your house for not a whole lot of money. $652 was a lot of money then, but not that much. And if you wanted a furnace, you had to pay an extra $70, et cetera. So uh, you had the land, and then you ordered the house by a catalog. Some of them were quite elaborate. And if you were living in this, I guess this looked pretty good, right? I found this one. That's actually the – I wish I had the slide. I cut it off. Um, I had it in the photograph, but right here on the mailbox is a little plaque that proudly ass asserts, you know, whatever it was, 1896, Sears House, 1896, and lists the model number. I thought that was pretty, pretty amazing. In this territory that looks something like this, this is near Montrose, Colorado, near the Utah line on the backside of the Grand Mesa. A lot of very peculiar street names. Road U. I mean, you're driving along, and you haven't seen any sign of a human being other than the street, other than the thing you're driving on, and suddenly you will see a sign that says, Quilting, seven and a half miles. <laughs> cattle wander around like they did in the south. There's, you can't enclose all this. So the cattle are just wandering around all through the brush, all everywhere. And um, these places were uh, unique, uniquely American. 
Uh, they were neither physically beautiful nor were they socially just, but they were full of latent potential for civic value. Uh, it drives me crazy that we have not tried to learn more in our history from our own past rather than sort of, as we see, adopting the principles of the Congress of International Architect Modern or other imported ideas. These courthouse towns we have in Texas, actually an early article written in Architectural Forum um, by um, the so-called Texas Rangers, which included uh, John Haydock and Colin Rowe and all these people in these courthouse towns. Really great. And it produces this extraordinary thing. This is eastern Ohio. This is Minnesota. This is actually uh, Fort Sumner, New Mexico, where Billy the Kid was held in jail. And you'll see that where you have arable land, uh, the geometry shows up. Where you can't farm it, where there's no water, it doesn't. It's just open territory. Uh, suburbs, part of uh, Columbus, Ohio, part of Minneapolis, all of this from the same altitude. And then my favorite, which is Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, the red um, angle that you see here is a quarter section of 160 acres. That's the 40-acre quarter of the quarter section. And um, this is down to a 10-acre area. And then you'll notice how all of the developers and the architects here have these kind of themed so you drive along here, and you'll see one that's called, you know, Old El Paso, and everything's in this kind of, you know, Spanish colonial architecture. And the next one is like, I don't know, some English village or something. It's really hilarious. Uh, now, um, f last slide. Um, so this is really about um, man, the political animal, right? About owning the land, working the land drawing your identity from the land, and then participating somehow in public life. Um, a new order arrives that we see here with the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe, which has to do with the geometry of something moving 60 miles an hour, having to turn. And that geometry is neither um, political nor economic. It is its own logic, obeying only the laws of physics. And this will create another kind of space in the world that we have yet to encounter, but will encounter from this point forward, which is called the space of flow, of flow, like a, like a plumbing diagram. Things are flowing, okay? Um, there we see it built out. So we have a hybrid here outside of Phoenix, Arizona, of the space of flow and the National Land Ordinance of 1785. The end. Sorry we ran over just a little bit.